Robert Caro is here for more than 20 years. He has devoted his career to chronicling the life of Lyndon Baines Johnson. The first two books in his series, The Years of Lyndon Johnson, cover the former president's Texas boyhood and his early years as a politician. Now with his third book, Master of the Senate, Caro details Johnson's 12 years in the United States Senate. I am pleased to welcome Robert Caro to this table, uh, and I should say that he has written other things, including a masterful biography of Robert Moses before he began uh, this uh, biography, a series on Lyndon Johnson. I am especially pleased to have Robert Caro here. Welcome. I'm glad to be here, Charlie. Thank you for coming. Let me, um, who do we see here? Tell me uh, how this Johnson, now that he has power in the Senate, is different from the Johnson we had met uh, growing up in Texas uh, and the wilderness years before he got to this place. This is where this is where he changes in the Senate. The first two books are about a Lyndon Johnson hungry for power. He doesn't have any, and he's willing to do almost anything to get it. Now he rises, as you said, through the Senate, and suddenly the youngest majority leader ever, and he has acquired real power. I think, you know, Lord, we all learn Lord Acton's axiom, all power yeah. corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. The more I write about power, the less I think that that's always true. I'll tell you what I think is always true, what power always does. Power reveals. When a person gets power, you can see what's underneath all along. And with Lyndon Johnson, what you see is as soon as he gets it, he turns and passes the first civil rights bill since Reconstruction. So here it says something very positive about Lyndon Johnson. I think we see what was underneath all along. But there is also a certain continuation Absolutely. of the nature of his personality. Absolutely. It's the same. You know, I know some people will say, oh, I'm more, I feel more favorably about yeah. Johnson now. Not at all. It's the same man. You see the same savage determination when he's young as you do in the Senate. When he wants something to get something, he's going to get it. But here, he, for the first time, he's using this ambition and determination to get something for, that's larger than himself. Before we continue, uh, because you are, um, you did the Robert Moses biography that, that won all, all the awards that were to win, and then embarked on this, uh, and it has been both admired and controversial. Yes. In the beginning, they said, Carol's too tough, has nothing he likes about Lyndon Johnson. Yeah. Now they're saying, here he has a chance to, to expand on some very positive things about Johnson, his legislative genius. Yes. Have you changed your opinion of him? Not at all. Uh, it's, uh, as I say, it's the same driven, almost tortured and tormented man. Uh, because of the, uh, this really terrible youth, this sad, poignant youth, uh, he's driven all his life. And uh, now, when, as I said, when he's on his way up, he wants desperately to get to the center. And his whole, you know, the last book, there was only, is a seven year period, uh, where all he really wants is to get to the Senate. It's hard to find anything positive that he did. When he gets to the Senate, uh, as I said, you see him uh, getting a whole, uh, not just civil rights, expanding uh, Social Security, raising the minimum wage, that other liberals couldn't get done. And I say in the book, you know, People like Hubert Humphrey and Paul Douglas, that we think of the great icons of liberalism, they made the speeches, but they could never have gotten these things through without a Lyndon Johnson. It's not until he picks up the banner of civil rights that at last it begins to move forward. What was his genius as well, his legislative tactician? Well, legisla legislative, uh, you know, in America, if I can just yeah, say this, sure. when we talk about political power, and you talk about it on your show very incisively, we're really talking about presidential power, executive power. We don't think of power as legislative power. Now, in England, where they have a parliamentary form of government, there must be a hundred biographies of Disraeli and a hundred biographies of Gladstone. Here, we have very few examinations of our legislative leaders. Now, Lyndon Johnson was the great legislative genius. You know what he says? He says, whatever else, this is his words, whatever else they say about me, I understand power. 
I know where to look for it, and I know how to use it. In a way, this book is just about that. You see, the first part of the book is him looking for power in the Senate before he becomes leader. You know, no one could lead the Senate. Albin Barkley, who's a leader before him, says, I can't lead them. I have nothing to promise them. I have nothing to threaten them with. Lyndon Johnson, as soon as he gets to the Senate, starts finding things to promise them and starts finding things to threaten them with and he leads the center so this book is really not only about lyndon johnson it's about the l nature of legislative power and in your words legislative genius how did he come to acquire that position of leadership in such a short period of time oh in part by flattery you know uh, the senate he called them the old bulls the committee chairman no one ever got close to one of them. Big Ed Johnson of Colorado, chairman of the Commerce Committee. Johnson gives him a nickname, Mr. Wisdom, you know. <laughs> I mean, something, you know, the adage where flattery is concerned, no excess is possible. He says, he goes to see him, and he says, every time he sees him, I need some advice from Mr. Wisdom. If there's another senator in the room talking, he says, you know, you ought to listen to what Mr. Wisdom has to say. He writes some letters addressed, dear Mr. Wisdom. Did it work? It worked. All right, the personal touch was very important. If I can tell one, okay, one incident, please, one of the old Southern senators who was never charmed by Lyndon Johnson was Harry F. Byrd, chairman of finance for, about, for a long time. From Virginia. From, excuse me, from Virginia. <laughs> yeah. Johnson cannot get close to him. In 1951, Harry Byrd's daughter, his beloved 35-year-old daughter, is killed in a fox hunt when she falls from a horse. Lyndon Johnson calls his friend Warren Magnuson, another senator, the senator from the state of Washington, says, we have to go to that funeral. Magnuson says something like, it's 72 miles away. It's in Winchester, Virginia. Johnson says, you don't understand, Maggie. Everybody, every senator will be there. The morning of that funeral, there's this tremendous storm. Magnuson calls Johnson to try to get out of it. Johnson says, says, no, we have to go. They drive down there. There are only two senators present, Lyndon Johnson and Warren Magnuson. They're standing on one side of the open grave, and Harry Byrd is standing on the other, so bent with grief that he never raises his head. But then, when the coffin is being lowered into the ground, Lyndon Johnson tells an assistant of his that night, Harry Byrd looked up at me. When he saw me there, he gave me a long, long look, Lyndon Johnson said. I don't know what that look meant, but it meant a lot. A few months later, Lyndon Johnson wants to be nominated for Democratic leader, and Harry Byrd seconds the nomination. There must be a thousand stories like that. There are. <laughs> it, it, it is the seduction of men. Uh, in part, it is. In part, it's a rule. It, that's, that's one part of it. Part, it's not personal. It's power. Johnson gets to the Senate, and he realizes he has one source of power that nobody else has. He and Sam Rayburn, it's almost a father-son relationship, and Rayburn will do almost anything for Lyndon Johnson. If a senator needs something, a dam or appropriation, it's not enough that he gets it through the Senate. It's not done until it gets through the House. Johnson is the only senator who can go to Rayburn and ask him to expedite a bill or put his power behind the bill. And almost immediately, other senators realize this. And you see this in the letters in the Johnson Library. Notes to Johnson from very powerful senators. Lyndon, my damn bill is stalled in the House. Could you put a word in the Speaker's ear? Or, Lyndon, uh, the appropriations bill, could you move it to the top of the pile on the Speaker's desk? When Johnson does this sort of a favor for people, he makes sure they know they owe him something. Let me go through some of the great figures in the Senate at that time. His relationship with Hubert Humphrey. <laughs> Hubert Humphrey. Johnson, when Humphrey starts out, he's this idealistic, powerful, the greatest speaker. Johnson gradually brings him. I, I, write, I write in this book, it's this, the story of Lyndon Johnson and Hubert Humphrey. It's the story of two strong personalities, but one is stronger and gradually the other comes more and more under his sway. In this book, we see Lyndon Johnson, this is an incredible to, to, to learn about, actually kicks Hubert Humphrey on the floor of the Senate when Humphrey doesn't move fast enough for him. Now, I had been told this story by a number of people. I wasn't going to use it. Uh, I thought it was exaggerated. 
then when I'm reading the columns from the years 1957, I come across a contemporaneous that day column from an old columnist named Robert S. Allen. He says, right. I thought Humphrey was exaggerating. <laughs> then he pulled up his trouser leg, and there was a scar. And then he pulled up the other leg, and there was another scar. Scars where Lyndon Johnson had kicked him when he said, get going now, and I didn't move fast. <laughs> Incredible story. Was there one senator who was more responsible for Johnson's success than any other? Absolutely. Richard Brevard Russell of Georgia, the Georgia giant. You know, when Johnson comes to the Senate, uh, the South controls it absolutely. And Richard Brevard uh, Russell is the Southern leader. They say he was the South's greatest general since Robert E. Lee. Johnson has to get close to him. He learns almost immediately that Russell is the power in the Senate. And he'll do any, you know, he, re, he learns that Russell likes baseball, so he starts to go to baseball games with him. Johnson <laughs> detested sports, or had no interest in sports. John Connolly told me, he said to, to Johnson when he sees Johnson going, I didn't know you liked baseball. <laughs> Lyndon says, didn't you know I always loved baseball, John? Uh, he knows Russell likes to visit the Civil War battlefields. He says, gee, I'd sure like to go along with you. And he starts inviting Russell, who's a lonely bachelor, to his home, if they're working late at the Senate, he says, Lady Bird has dinner ready anyway. Why don't you come along? And Russell starts to come, this very lonely man who didn't socialize a lot, starts to come to Lyndon Johnson's house for dinner. And Lady Bird, Southern charm, is definitely, uh, she's very gracious, very Southern, and she makes Russell feel at home. And Johnson, Bobby Baker once said about Johnson's relationship and how he flattered Russell, he said, if Russell was a woman, Lyndon would have married him. <laughs> <laughs> Let me take a look at this. This is some clips from American Experience, LBJ, because we are talking about him. Uh, here is the first oh. clip of his rise to become the Senate Majority Leader. Take a look. Johnson always knew where the power was. In Texas, he cozied up to the oil barons. In the Senate, he attached himself to the Southern Conservatives and their influential leader, Richard Brevard Russell of Georgia. Senator Russell was a lonely bachelor. He read probably 10 books a week. He was a loner. Lyndon Johnson, at this time, knew where the power was. And uh, had uh, Senator Russell been a woman, he would have married him because, because uh, uh, or married her. Under Russell's patronage, Johnson was given the job of party whip. He transformed what had been a minor post into a seat of power. Two years later, he was elected Democratic leader. Landslide Lyndon was now one of the most powerful men in the United States Senate. Power. Um, there are wonderful stories of Johnson and the treatment, what's called the Johnson treatment. Right. Beyond what you have said, what was it? I mean, how did he go about, in a sense, uh, there's this wonderful yeah. photograph, I think maybe during the majority leader period or else during the presidential period, where he's leaning over to the right. senator from Rhode Island, right. I think, the Green. majority leader. Yeah. 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 Well, that's, you know, I say in the book, Lyndon Johnson was not a reader of books. He didn't like to read books. He was the greatest reader of men. He had, you know, he used to tell his assistants, Watch their eyes, watch their hands. What a man is telling you with his mouth is never as important as what he's telling you with his eyes. He used to say, what a man is telling you is never as important as what he's not telling you. Don't let the conversation end until you find out what he's not twice trying not to tell you. So he had a genius for knowing men's weaknesses and strengths, what they really wanted. Not what they said they wanted always, but what they really wanted. And he would appeal to that. Uh, he would put this big arm around your shoulder with the other hand, he'd grab the lapel, he'd lean that big face into you, and he would use whatever he had to use to get you to do what he wanted. Uh, you know, I can tell you, uh, Scoop Jackson, the senator from the state of Washington, the other senator from the state of Washington, who worked with Johnson very closely for 25 years, both in the House of Representatives and in the Senate, tried to define the difference between President Kennedy and President Johnson this way. I, it's a pretty exact quote. He said, President Kennedy would call the senator to the White House, and he would explain why this bill was so important. But if the senator said his constituency simply wouldn't allow him to go along, that he couldn't do this, President Kennedy would always say he understood. He was sorry they couldn't end the degree, but he understood. Lyndon Johnson, Scoop Jackson says, 
Lyndon Johnson would refuse to understand. He would charm you or threaten you or bribe you or cajole you. He would do anything he had to to get your vote, but he'd get it. That was the thing. He'd get it. What's the best example that comes to mind of a threat? Of a, of a threat? Uh, well, uh, with Paul Douglas, uh, who is the great liberal senator from Illinois, yeah. He warned, Former professor of economics and all that. Professor of economics, also a war hero. You know, he enlisted in the Marines at the age of 50 and charged up a beach and won the silver. So Johnson hated Douglas anyway. The way they hated, he hated him because Douglas was the opposite of him. Lyndon Johnson said it's not the job of a politician to say principled things. Paul Douglas said the principle is the important thing. Johnson, uh, Lyndon Johnson wore the silver star and didn't deserve it. Paul Douglas had earned the silver star. Johnson warns Douglas not to keep pressing for a civil rights bill in, seven, in 1956. Douglas, refu Douglas knows he's going to lose, but he's determined to have a vote on this. But he doesn't know what's going to happen to him. Johnson has warned him not to do this. So Douglas makes this motion. Johnson has all the power. He has lined everybody up on his side. Douglas makes the motion, and the guy in the chair starts to say, all the eyes, all the nose, you know, a meaningless voice vote. Johnson stands up at his majority leader desk and demands a voice vote. So Douglas has to sit there. The vote is 76 to 6 against him. Even his own <coughs> friends, most of them, won't vote for him. He's so, he has to sit there while 76 people refuse to report him. He walks out of this office, and his aide, Howard Schumann, comes running up to him. Douglas is almost crying. He goes over to the elevator. He says, press the button three times. Let's pretend we're senators. That's how a senator rang for yeah. him. Then Douglas writes in his memoir, I went up to my office, I shut the door behind me, and I did cry. That's what Lyndon Johnson could do to a man who didn't listen to him. Make him cry. Yes, make a strong <coughs> man cry. What was the relationship with Lyndon, with, between Lyndon Johnson and John Connolly? Well, Connolly was the aide closest to Johnson. You know, uh, he goes to work with Johnson when he's very young. Johnson sees in Connolly a, a, a tool that he can really use. Connolly's a great speaker. So Connolly would do almost anything for Johnson. He would carry cash for him, you know, and I, I think I wrote in either I guess it's the 1941 campaign. Johnson is running for the Senate. He needs cash. John Connolly flies to Houston and gets fifty thousand dollars in a brown paper and brings it back in a brown paper bag. He's met at the Austin airport, coming back by a, his friend Charlie Herring, a, a young attorney. They go to an all-night diner, right, to have something to eat, <laughs> and they leave the Ch Connolly leaves the fifty thousand uh, dollars in the uh, in the booth, and it's really funny to ask the two of them how fast they drove back. <laughs> They realized it was gone. But Connolly was a great <laughs> asset. Yeah. <laughs> when Johnson wants to be nominated for president in 1956, Connolly gives the nominating speech, and it's a great speech. Uh, Connolly was a master politician. It was really quite sad because Connolly once said to me, you know, I always thought I was going to be a great figure in history. This is not a direct quote, but it's the idea. Now I know that I'll be remembered mostly for my association with Lyndon Johnson. Um, it is sad, actually. Yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, when I would talk to him, there was never a question that I asked him that he would not answer. He said to me, if you interview me, of course, I was happy to interview him, I will answer every question. No matter how delicate the subject was, there was never a question he wouldn't answer So he, from there me. was no question he didn't answer from you? Correct. Anybody missing from this that you couldn't find? Uh, from that book? Yeah, from the I, Senate years. From the Senate years? Uh, well, I would have loved to talk to Richard Brevard yeah. Russell because he was closest to Johnson. Yeah. I was, he had died. He never wrote about him, never talked about him. Yes, he did. That's yeah. a, you always ask the right <laughs> question. I thought I was never going to get any insights into Russell from Russell's mouth. And then I discovered that a television interviewer had interviewed him for three straight hours, very late in his life on the porch of his home in Winder. And of course, a lot of the things that he yeah. says there cast absolutely new light on Lyndon Johnson, like Johnson had persuaded everybody that he never attended the Southern Caucus, the meeting of the right. Southern Senators. The reporter says to Richard Russell, I understand that Lyndon Johnson never attended the Southern Caucus. Richard Russell says, yes, he did. He certainly did. Uh, and then he goes on to, to name a couple of times uh, yeah. in which Johnson does uh, 
a ten. And in that conversation with the with that reporter on that porch in Georgia, yes. uh, do you get a sense of how Russell felt about Johnson, his judgment about Johnson? Uh, yeah, th yes. their relationship extended through the Vietnam War, yes. and we now know from Johnson tapes yes. that Russell was saying things like Lyndon. Yes, you know, I'm not sure we ought to be there. That right. Russell had grave reservations about the war, and Russell was chairman of the Senate Armed, Armed Services, Services Committee. Committee. Yes, Go ahead. you get a lot of sense from that. You know, uh, of course, by the time this interview was conducted, Russell and Johnson have had this real falling out. Uh, but you do get a sense of what Russell saw in Johnson early on. This incredible ability, you know. Russell, they said, read the congressional record every day. So did Lyndon Johnson. Russell knew all about the, the, the political situation in a senator's home state. He made it his business to know. So did Lyndon Johnson. You can't, Russell was a master legislator. You can't fool a master of a craft about how good another man is. He saw that Johnson was just a great senator. And, you know, Russell really raises him to power in the Senate. This is what this book, Master of the Senate, I think shows more than any other book, and it's the most important thing. Johnson is raised to power by the South. He's raised to power by the Southern Bloc in the Senate. Because they were the most powerful bloc. Absolutely. And through 1956, he follows their lead. He, he's a he, total adherent. Serves their interest. Totally. And then? In 1957, he changes, he reverses course 180 degrees. In yeah. the meantime, he's bridged a gap, you know, a relationship with Hubert Humphrey right. and other liberal members of the Senate. But, but although, you always, that's right. But although he's bridged the gap, there's a gap he can't bridge. Lyndon Johnson wants to be president. This is the strongest driving force. Jim Rowe, one of Johnson's intimates right. in Washington, once said to me, from the day he got here, all he wanted was to be president. He realizes in 1956 that he is never going to be president with just the South, and that the Northern liberals will not accept him, no matter what else he does, unless he passes a civil rights bill. Jim Rowe writes him a memo in 1957. He says, this is Armageddon for Lyndon Johnson. You either pass a civil rights bill this year, or you can forget about being president. Johnson has always had this compassion to want to help poor people right. of color. Now it coincides with his ambition. He reverses course and he passes the Civil Rights Bill. Roll tape. This is our last excerpt from American Experience, but it is about the 57 Civil Rights Bill. Here it is. By the middle of the summer, the Johnson treatment was having its effect. Senator, there is some talk of a compromise. Do you see any area for a compromise? Well, I haven't had any compromise presented to me yet, but I am a, a realist and a reasonable man. By skillful maneuvering, Johnson engineered a bill acceptable to all sides. The compromise has been negotiated. I'm pleased that the bill will pass. It is a great step forward in a very important and delicate feat. On August 7th, the Senate passed the Civil Rights Act of 1957. But Johnson had traded away the muscle in the law. In theory, the law protected the voting rights of blacks. In fact, it gave the federal government no real power of enforcement. You were saying about that picture? Yeah, yes. Uh, that picture is an example of his genius that's incredible. You know who's in that picture? Who? On Russell from the South and Frank Church from the Northwest. There's a point where the South is not going to let the bill go forward. It's not even on the final vote. They're going to filibuster the motion to bring it to the floor, and they're going to win. The South won't let it go forward unless they know that if the final bill is unacceptable to them, they will have some support. Frank Church is the leader of the Northwesterners on Hell's Canyon. Hell's Canyon is this gorge between Idaho and Oregon. The Northwesterners who want public power want a federal dam there. The South has always opposed the federal dam there because they don't like expansion of pub, uh, federal power, and they say private companies would do it anyway. This is what ge genius is. Johnson has to find the Southerners a block of votes, not one or two. That's not going to help here. He needs a block. There are 12 Democratic senators from the Northwest. He lets the South know that they should give enough support to Hell's Canyon 
so that the Northwesterners will, if it's, if it's compatible with their principles and interests, support a bill on civil rights that the South can live with. They have a Hell's Canyon vote and the signal is given. Five Southerners vote with, for Hell's Canyon and for the first time it's approved. That and the civil rights bill moves forward. I mean, that is genius. I mean, no one else. You're talking about a man, Lyndon Johnson, who could see an entire country as one unit. Here's the South. There's the Northwest. Only he sees the link between the two things. And it's, that's an example of legislative genius. This is a masterful biography. Uh, Master of the Senate is the story of Lyndon Johnson at the height of his power. Whatever else you say about him, he is probably, in the judgment of most people who knew the Senate uh, and knew Washington politics, one of the most interesting figures to come along for a long time and probably deserving of the four books that Bob Caro has dedicated uh, to the task. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. We'll be right back. We'll meet the great Gambon. Michael Gambon plays Lyndon Johnson, and you'll see excerpts from that performance in Path to War. Stay with us. Legislate, legislative, uh, you know, in America, if I can just yeah, say this, sure. when we talk about political power, and you talk about it on your show very incisively, we're really talking about presidential power, executive power. We don't think of power as legislative power. Now, in England, where they have a parliamentary form of government, there must be a hundred biographies of Disraeli and a hundred biographies of Gladstone. Here, we have very few examinations of our legislative leaders. Now, Lyndon Johnson was the great legislative genius. You know what he says? He says, whatever else, this is his words, whatever else they say about me, I understand power. I know where to look for it, and I know how to use it. In a way, this book is just about that. You see, the first part of the book is him looking for power in the Senate before he becomes leader. You know, no one could lead the Senate. Albin Barkley, who's a leader before him, says, I can't lead them. I have nothing to promise them. I have nothing to threaten them with. <laughs> Lyndon Johnson, as soon as he gets to the Senate, changes in the Senate. The first two books are about a Lyndon Johnson hungry for power. He doesn't have any, and he's willing to do almost anything to get now he rises, as you said, through the Senate, and suddenly the youngest majority leader ever, and he has acquired real power. I think, you know, Lord, we all learn Lord Acton's axiom, all power mm -hmm. corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. The more I write about power, the less I think that that's always true. I'll tell you what I think is always true what power always does. Power reveals. When a person gets power, you can see what's underneath all along. And with Lyndon Johnson, what you see is as soon as he gets it, he turns and passes the first civil rights bill since Reconstruction. So here it says something very positive about Lyndon Johnson. I think we see what was underneath all along. But there is also a certain continuation Absolutely. of the nature of his personality. Absolutely. It's the same, you know, I know some people will say, oh, I'm more, I feel more favorably about yeah. Johnson now. Not at all. It's the same in youth. Uh, he's driven all his life. And uh, now, when, as I said, when he's on his way up, he wants desperately to get to the center. And his whole, you know, the last book, there was only, is a seven year period, uh, where all he really wants is to get to the Senate. It's hard to find anything positive that he did. When he gets to the Senate, uh, as I said, you see him that, uh, getting a whole, uh, not just civil rights, expanding uh, social security, raising the minimum wage, that other liberals couldn't get done. And I say in the book, you know, People like Hubert Humphrey and Paul Douglas, that we think of the great icons of liberalism, they made the speeches, but they could never have gotten these things through without a Lyndon Johnson. It's not until he picks up the banner of civil rights that at last it begins to move forward. What was his genius as well, his legislative tactician? Well, let Robert Caro is here. For more than 20 years, he has devoted his career to chronicling the life of Lyndon Baines Johnson. The first two books in his series, The Years of Lyndon Johnson, cover the former president's Texas boyhood and his early years as a politician. Now with his third book, Master of the Senate, Caro details Johnson's 12 years in the United States Senate. I am pleased to welcome Robert Caro to this table, uh, and I should say that he has written other things, including a masterful biography of Robert Moses before he began uh, this uh, 
biography, a series on Lyndon Johnson. I am especially pleased to have Robert Carroll here. Welcome. I'm glad to be here, Charlie. Thank you for coming. Let me, um, who do we see here? Tell me uh, how this Johnson, now that he has power in the Senate, is different from the Johnson we had met uh, growing up in Texas uh, and the wilderness years before he got to this place. This is where this is where he changed. You see the same savage determination when he's young as you do in the Senate. When he wants something to get something, he's going to get it. But here he for the first time he's using this ambition and determination to get something for, that's larger than himself. Before we continue, uh, because you are um, you did the Robert Moses biography that that won all all the awards that were to win and then embarked on this, uh, and it has been both admired and controversial. Yes. In the beginning, they said, Carroll's too tough, has nothing he likes about Lyndon Johnson. Yeah. Now they're saying, here he has a chance to, to expand on some very positive things about Johnson, his legislative genius. Yes. Have you changed your opinion of him? Not at all. Uh, it's, uh, as I say, it's the same driven, almost tortured and tormented man. Uh, because of the, uh, this really terrible youth, this sad, poignant